Uh, yeah, we've called this uh, this series the Savior of the World. We've got a shortish study of the Gospel of Luke. We're here in um, our 12th session um, of this series. Um, it's a not so short as it was going to be study of the Gospel of Luke, because technically this week should be the last week, and it is the last week of the 12 um, week round of classes. But we are going to continue with um, uh, with more studies, as you will see as we uh, get towards the end of the class. So we're listening to the story as God told it through Luke, uh, so that we can better understand the message of the good news that he shares with us in the way um, in which he does share it with us. So as always, please feel free to ask questions. And you can either do that in the chat window or we'll open things up at the end. Last week, you may remember that we returned by boat from the far side of the lake and we were welcomed um, by a waiting crowd who were terribly pleased to see us again. Um, we saw Jesus healing a woman, raising from the dead the daughter of Jairus, a synagogue leader, and then we saw him training the 12 for mission by sending them out through the villages, preaching the good news and healing everywhere. We very briefly encountered Herod once more, who seemed rather perplexed as to who Jesus was. And then we enjoyed a sumptuous feast of fish and chips. Well, maybe not chips as such, but um, uh, fish and, 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 and bread um, before wrapping things up for the evening. Well, as we begin this evening, um, yeah, as we begin this evening, we'll find Jesus praying alone with the disciples nearby, and we'll witness a monumentous event in the understanding of just who this Jesus, this teacher from Nazareth, uh, just who he really is. Then we'll hear a profound lesson as to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, before witnessing one of the most underrated events of human history. Uh, and uh, this is a truly remarkable event, which really deserves far more attention than is generally given to it, and far more attention than we will have time for this evening, I fear. <clears throat> and um, this event has to do with the suffering and execution of their teacher, Jesus, and it comes at a very pivotal moment in this narrative. In fact, in uh, a number of ways, we are with this session reaching something of a climax halfway or so through the book, because from next week and onwards, we will be heading towards Jerusalem. Uh, maybe not literally, we'll leave that to um, um, uh, Yvonne and whoever else might be heading there in a few uh, a few weeks' time. Um, oh, uh, I should say, we'll witness another healing before learning something of the inner workings of the Twelve. Uh, yes, so our outline for this session this evening, we'll take a look at the Christ of God, a call to discipleship, the transformation, the healing of the boy, another foretelling, and we'll ask, or rather, they will be asking, who is the greatest? So that's just our little outline. So we know sort of roughly approximately where we might be going um, over the next um, 40 minutes or so. Well, fasten seatbelts and here we go. It happened that um, as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. Here we are, we're in chapter 9, of course, picking up in verse 18, if you like. Um, as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter answered, 
the Christ of God. Well, then he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Well, um, he begins, now it happened that as he was praying alone, it would be terribly easy to simply skip over this phrase as being merely incidental. But for Luke, prayer was a vital part of the life of Jesus and also of his disciples. We probably already noted something like this before, but did you know that half of the references to prayer within the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, uh, yeah, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, half of the references to prayer within the synoptics are found in uh, Luke with only two uh, in John's gospel. And Luke mentions prayer no fewer than 31 times in his second volume, the book of Acts. So I think we should get the idea that this is intended um, to be noticed as he begins by saying that it happened as he was praying alone. Well, he asks his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am. And this is essentially here the culmination of Luke's presentation of the growing awareness of the identity of Jesus. Um, you, uh, you may recall that just um, a few weeks ago, uh, we heard the crowds declaring that a great prophet has risen among us there back in uh, chapter seven. And then a little bit later, there's this delegation that comes from John, the prophet John, and they ask, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Of course, remember, it's terribly easy for us because we've read to the end of the book, but none of these people had. So is he a great prophet? Uh, is he the one to come? Should they look for another? The religious people, you may recall, who were there in the house of Simon the Pharisee said, who is this who even forgives sins? And then you may recall the perplexity of Herod um, when um, uh, we are told that it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. And these very same thoughts are being repeated here. Uh, so I think it is important for us to understand. I think Luke is deliberately um, recording this progression for us to understand that there was a growing awareness among the people that this Jesus of Nazareth was certainly someone very special, but that his full identity hadn't yet been revealed. So Jesus says to his disciples, okay, but who do you say that I am? And who else but Peter answered, you are the Christ of God. Now, knowing what we know, and what many of us have known for many years, this may not sound like such an outrageous confession, but it was. Many, many would have considered a confession such as this to have been nothing less than blasphemous. But Peter, possibly speaking on behalf of all uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, 12 as a whole, and maybe the one or two or three others who might have been there as well. Peter recognized that Jesus was not simply 
a great teacher, not even simply a great prophet. He was someone unique, the likes of which they had never encountered before. Now, for many generations, the Jewish people had long awaited a deliverer. Uh, there were uh, many different understandings of just who this deliverer was to be. Indeed, um, misunderstandings even as to how many deliverers there might be. But one term often used was that of the Christ. That's the Greek for the Hebrew, the Messiah, uh, which is Hebrew for the English, essentially the anointed one. Yes, there was an expectation that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, uh, the coming king, if you like, of whom the prophets had spoken. In fact, these terms are fairly synonymous with the idea of the expectation of the son or the descendant of David. He was the one that they were longing for. Well, the fact that Peter acknowledges Jesus to be the Christ doesn't mean that he understood either the true nature of the Christ, uh, nor all that such a title entailed. In fact, it's pretty obvious that they really didn't understand that. They still had a huge amount to learn. And what they were about to hear may very well have undermined all that they presently understood of the coming Messiah. For he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, "The Son of Man must suffer, and many uh, uh, sorry, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed on the third, and on the third day, be raised." Now, this declaration of king uh, 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 an acceptance of kingship uh, for such was the essential nature of this confession this declaration and acceptance of kingship might well have been accompanied by thoughts of conquest and victory and your know, ruling power and, and authority but no sooner had peter gone public albeit within the confines of this relatively small group of disciples. No sooner had Peter gone public with this confession that Jesus forbade them from making it known any further, because things were not as they might have expected. The way ahead might well bring conquest and victory and ruling power and authority, but first there was to be suffering and rejection, and slaughter, and resurrection. But all of this was too much for them to take on board. Uh, this, we might note, is the first time that Jesus predicts his suffering and death. But why does he prevent them? Why does he forbid them from revealing this to others. Well, though his actual identity is to remain a secret for the time being, presumably it's because the people simply wouldn't understand what were the true implications of the coming of the Messiah. Uh, if, if the whole world had got to know of it, they would have expected something that wasn't about to happen. Their expectations were not in line with the teachings of Scripture. Uh, so even though his identity was to remain a secret for the time being, it seems that the prediction of his suffering and death were made more widely known. Now, all of this might still have perplexed his closer disciples. 
But it was important that the road ahead should be made clear to them, for this was also the road that was to be trodden by those who would follow him, both then and now. And so he then said to all that if anyone would come after me, and that is the me who is to be betrayed, who is to suffer, who is to be executed, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. It seems to me particularly important that we understand how this whole section fits together. Uh, we, we do not have here a series of disconnected events, but rather we have a development of matters which lie at the very core of the identity of Jesus and of the nature of what we might call discipleship. These are really critical matters. And I don't think that we can really begin to understand the confusion which must have prevailed among the disciples, you know, because we've read to the end of the book. We know what happens and we know kind of how it all works out, at least up until this point in time. But they've got to be thinking, how could he be the Christ, the one for whom generations eagerly awaited, but at the same time, um, oh, that doesn't sound right, does it? I must have mistyped something there, apologies. Uh, but at the same time, um, be um, uh, you know, uh, heading towards suffering and death. I mean, you know, how, how, how do these things fit together? I mean, this might have seemed to be a complete contradiction. On the one hand, here comes the Christ for whom we have been waiting for generation upon generation. But on the other hand, He's, um, he speaks of suffering and, and death. So a complete contradiction and maybe also a huge disappointment. I mean, this isn't what we had come to expect. Uh, and their expectations might have been varied, but they certainly didn't include this. And this is a matter that's addressed on numerous occasions throughout the rest of Scripture, which continues to uh, baffle um, many today. The, uh, the, the, the compatibility of kingship with suffering and death. If Jesus is indeed the Christ of God, then this is very clear. The way of God is a way of suffering and death. There's really no getting away from it. This is a, a, a fundamental principle. When this is properly understood, so much else in Scripture makes sense, and so much else of life makes sense too. One of the fundamental problems that so many have in accepting the God, uh, well, accepting God, accepting the God um, revealed in Scripture, has to do with suffering and death in one way or another. 
But if we rightly understand that the way of God is a way of suffering and death, and of course, then resurrection and life, when we can understand that, so many things make much more sense, and so much of Scripture makes much more sense. And I'm sure that these are some of the things that began to fall into place when Jesus spoke with disciples following his resurrection, when, you know, everything began to become more clear to them. But here's another truth, that if we are going to be followers of Jesus, then we are to follow in the way of Jesus, and the way of Jesus is the way of the cross. Again, that is fundamentally true. I suspect that mention of the cross has likely lost impact since these words were first spoken. To us, the cross might often seem little more than a symbol, and maybe some of you are wearing one you know, around your neck, and uh, you know, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Of course, we may feel a little odd were we to hang around our neck, I don't know, an axe and an executioner's block, or uh, a gallows, or maybe even an electric chair or something. That would seem a little peculiar to us, but that in essence is the reality of the cross. To those who first heard these words, the cross was a brutal instrument of torture and execution perfected by the Romans. So to take up our cross daily is a most terribly profound commitment. It's not simply choosing to be religious on a daily basis. We commit on a daily basis to lose our life for Jesus. And this might be seen as the ultimate in self-denial, but self-denial is to be the order of the day, every day that we walk with Jesus. Did, did I ever tell you of a conversation that I once overheard, I might have done, in which a believer was trying to explain to a curious individual that becoming a Christian made little difference to life other than giving up a couple of hours each Sunday morning? Yes, I really heard that. What absolute balderdash, and there are other words we might think of, you know, to describe that way. I mean, what absolute piffle, you know, I mean, the, the, the idea that, that, that following Jesus, that the only difference, I mean, when we decide to follow Jesus at that point, we renounce our own lives and we lose them for him. Yeah? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, our lives are no longer our own. Uh, for we have to use language elsewhere. We've been bought uh, with a price. We are owned by God. Uh, the way of Christ may well and is the way of life, but it is first a way of death. And we don't like to hear that, perhaps, but it's the way that it is. And certainly for many of those to whom Jesus was there speaking, it was going to be a reality maybe sooner than later. Uh, so, so um, in all of this, I, I, and we haven't, I, I want to, uh, yes, so, so uh, Carla had mentioned about verses 26 and 27 towards the end of that. I, I probably were picking up what whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man, be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the father. Uh, I, I, I suspect that they would not have understood. Absolutely. You know, it must have been very confusing. But here, Jesus is certainly looking ahead to uh, to, to some finality, uh, to some uh, culmination of uh, the, the, the whole purpose of God, uh, that, uh, and, and which he then goes on to speak in terms of, of uh, the, 
the kingdom uh, and the coming of the kingdom. So I did want to um, uh, mention that last part when he says, I tell you uh, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. It, it may be that some there were thinking that without exception, all those who followed Jesus would soon be dead. Uh, the language that Jesus is using here was surely very disturbing. It wasn't what they expected. When Peter made his confession that Jesus was the Christ of God, you might sort of get the idea that from there on everything was going to be glorious, and yet Jesus immediately speaks of suffering and death and of resurrection, yes, um, but, but none of that is going to make a great deal of sense, and, and, and they're not going to understand these things until uh, such time uh, as, uh, as they have taken place. As for what is meant by until they see the kingdom of God, there's a number of ideas presented. I'm going to list what I think are the three most popular. Some suggest that the reference to seeing the kingdom of God is to events which immediately followed in this narrative eight days later um, to the, the so-called transfiguration. Some think that the uh, seeing the kingdom of God is referring to the coming of the Spirit on that day of Pentecost recorded at the beginning of the book of Acts, and some think that it's speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Um, or, of course, it could be speaking of something else, but we can't go much further than AD 70 if there are some who were standing there who would still be living. Um, you understand. Uh, I favor the last of these. I think that he probably is speaking about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, but I can understand how maybe, um, you know, the events recorded in Acts 2 might be preferred by some, but the use of the language, some, if you were to say there are some um, who are standing here who won't uh, die or who will still be alive, you know, a, a year or so down the line, I, 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 that, that just seems a little odd. And language like this certainly can well fit the judgment of um, Jerusalem and of the people of God and of the, in essence, what, 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 what is seen in some ways as being the finality of the establishment of the kingdom. More of that some other time, perhaps. We have not time for it now, for we must move on to that next event. We can um, discuss more of that later if you would like to do so, in which um, we have this transfer. The, the, the word that is normally used, the transfiguration, um, is an interesting word. I'm not a... I, there, yes, there, there may be. There may be some um, versions that use that. In fact, did the authorized version use the word transfigured? Um, the idea of transformed, although Luke doesn't actually use the word um, metamorphosis in his text, but it is it's it's a transformation. We might um, we might say in in, in sort of common uh, parlance. About eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James. Normally we think of Peter, James and John, don't we? I think um, so. Peter and John and James, which incidentally is the order in which they occur in, um, uh, in, in the book of Acts, isn't it? As far as their appearances. Anyway, he goes up onto this mountain to pray. Um, and as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. His clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him. Um, yeah, not any old two men, but Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. 
but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Well, as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Now, as I've already suggested, this must be one of the most underrated events in the course of human history. It is as if Peter and John and James are witnessing heaven and earth come together in defiance of every law of time and space. And uh, beyond any shadow of doubt, this memory would stay with them until their dying breath. I mean, they were going to witness a lot of things in their life. But this event, there was something absolutely um, incredible about it. As for the details, well, as he was praying, as we've already noted, a central activity of Luke's writings, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. This is not simply a vision. This is what happened. But we, we must understand in all of this that the events that are unfolding on the top of that mountain are not natural. They are certainly supernatural. Uh, they are beyond any uh, thing that we have ever experienced, I'm quite sure. So having just spoken of his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels, these three disciples now witness what Peter will later describe uh, in his second letter um, as his majesty when he received honor and glory from God the Father. So yes, Peter may have said nothing about it at the time, but he certainly remembers it, and he uh, recounts it there in his second letter. Now, behold, we're told two men were talking with him, Moses Elijah, who appeared in glory, spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Uh, truly astonishing, more than simply a vision, we might observe that this, of course, was the only time when Moses ever set foot in the promised land. So, yep, he did finally make it um, <laughs> a long time after. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. And it's the only time when Moses and Elijah actually met, at least on Earth. Um, and that's, you know, we, 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 we sort of think of, you know, the... Um, uh, the, 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 the amazement of uh, you know, Peter and John and James meeting um, Moses and Elijah. Well, Moses and Elijah had never met on earth before, uh, but um, presumably they knew who each other was. And somehow or other, uh, Peter and John and James also knew. I doubt that they had name badges on, but you never know. Um, so uh, they were able certainly to recognize them somehow or other. Now, their presence indicates that just like Abraham, these two were living and not dead. For, as Jesus would say elsewhere, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. So even as we speak tonight, Abraham lives. Moses and Elijah live. Uh, those whom we have loved in the Lord continue to live. And that is, um, uh, that is significant. So Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, they're having this conversation. It's a little bizarre, isn't it? But they're having this conversation. And they are speaking of his departure. The word that Luke uses there is exodus which, of course, bearing in mind Moses' presence, he knows quite a little bit about exoduses, and, of course, so does Elijah in his own fashion, too. Um, so his depart, they're speaking of his exodus, which he is soon to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, that is significant. Again, we've had mention of uh, of his suffering, of his death, his mention of Jerusalem, because by the time that we get to the end of this passage, the rest of Luke 
is uh, the Luke's gospel. We're going to be heading to Jerusalem. That's uh, that is where it is all going to happen. So here's a conversation among men who knew of the nature of life and death. For two of them, they had already experienced their own personal departures, albeit in somewhat different fashions. So we might ask the question, uh, why Moses and Elijah? Well, not a lot of people know this, but a picture was taken at the time. I thought oh, I thought I had a I really thought that I had a picture of uh, let's see oh there it is i knew we had it there we go um here is uh here they are on the top of the mountain yeah okay do with that whatever you will um uh, moses spoke um uh the presence of moses you know we always say what why why moses and elijah well moses you know, kind of spoke of one like him who was to arise you may recall in uh, deuteronomy chapter 18 isn't it he speaks of you know one coming after him uh who would be like him um, and elijah maybe speaks of his arrival uh, you remember how that Elijah was to come? Of course, Elijah did come in the person of John, uh, the prophet John. And um, so they both represent uh, significant aspects of the coming of the Christ. Maybe also because Moses and Elijah represent the, the law and the prophets. Uh, more about that in just a couple of minutes okay so um oh so there we go the end uh, uh master peter says it's good that we're here let us make three tents one for you one for moses one for elijah so confirmation that they recognize who these men are they'd been asleep when they woke up i imagine they would have been rather shaken uh, a little surprised. It's not every day you wake up and expect uh, Moses and Elijah to be in the building um, or on the top of the mountain, wherever you might be waking up. Uh, Luke indicates that Peter didn't really know what he was talking about. Um, that's pretty typical of some of us, perhaps, when we've just woken up. Um, but maybe he was simply wanting to prolong the experience by making three tents for them. Uh, some have suggested that he was wanting to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, one that a feast that looked forward to greater things. I'm not sure that Peter was thinking of that. Luke's told us that he didn't really know what he was saying. Should we read that into it? Um, I don't know. Do with that as you will. What I do know is that a cloud enveloped them, as can easily happen on a mountain, uh, but from this cloud, they hear the voice of God saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So there had been a time for Moses and Elijah, a time for the law and the prophets, but now it was time to listen to Jesus. As one writer would later say, long ago, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world, and he is the one to whom we must now listen. Mentioned there of my chosen one, maybe reminiscent of Isaiah 42, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Um, and another passage that we would generally tag as being messianic. Well, they're left alone. They kept silent. They don't tell anyone in those days of what they have seen. And then there is an intended contrast. On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. A man, behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. For he's my only child. Behold, a spirit seizes him. And he suddenly uh, cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, shatters him, and will uh, hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. <laughs> And Jesus answered, O oh, faith, 
breathless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. Uh, while he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. Well, this event is clearly associated with what has just taken place by the use of the phrase on the next day when they had come down from the mountain. And the emphasis is not so much on the miracle itself, but rather on the failure of those disciples um, who had not ascended the mountain, um, their failure to heal this poor boy. And so we really can't help but notice this stark contrast between the mountaintop experience and the failed attempt at healing, uh, a very deliberate contrast, both events having taken place at the same time, of course. Uh, there is a fairly well-known painting by the Italian Renaissance master Raphael. It is entitled The Transfiguration. There it is. And there's Raphael, just in case you needed to see him. Uh, and um, it's an incredible picture, really. It's a um, uh, rather old picture, of course, very colorful, beautiful picture. Uh, but, but it depicts at the top half of the picture, uh, whether well, you can see it as a whole there, I thought you may be better see it that way first. But uh, um, the top half of the picture portrays the, uh, the, the glory of God being starkly contrasted uh, with the, um, the failure of uh, faithlessness. Um, at this, um, this chap here who um, was unable to be cured. And so, uh, yep, uh, Raphael saw that contrast very clearly uh, and uh, portrayed it in this fashion so um, and of course in typical uh, renaissance style of course should we make anything of the irony of the first words heard as they came down from the mountain being from a father concerning his only child bearing in mind the words that they heard on the mountain were from a father concerning his only child do with that as you will. And naturally, he seems disappointed, but he's confident that the teacher can indeed heal him. Uh, but the response of Jesus is rather enlightening. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? The problem was one of faithlessness, and Jesus clearly associates faithlessness with the state of this world in stark contrast with where he will be when his time to leave has come. So he says, how long am I to be with you? Um, among your faithfulness, among your perversion, how long am I to bear with you? I don't think these are words of exasperation. I think they're words of compassion. Uh, I, 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 because I know that Jesus was genuinely, of course, concerned for their well-being, but they have failed. Remember that these disciples have already been sent out on one training mission. You think that they would know what it's all about, but they have failed. And their failure has been due to faithlessness, because once Jesus appears on the scene, then uh, the lad is healed. And the response of the crowd was astonishment at the majesty, at the greatness of God. However, whilst they might marvel at this, evil is yet to be faced. And so, again, deliberately portraying a contrast uh, of events that are, of those that are to be, while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. 
Uh, and we have here the second prediction of coming betrayal and suffering at the hands of men. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Of course, they didn't understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Isn't that fascinating? It's a very fascinating insight into the relationship between teacher and student. The fear of the students to ask him, did they maybe fear that they might have looked stupid? I think Jesus already knew that they were, generally speaking. Um, were, they, um, were they afraid to know the truth? Uh, I mean, after all, it was much more preferable to be marveling at the good things that were being done than to be dwelling upon the bad times that were to come. Uh, so they just didn't understand. They didn't get it. And I'm sure that we would not have got it had we not have already read to the end of the book. I sometimes wish when thinking of these things, if only we could somehow, not that we would want to do this, but if only we could somehow eradicate all knowledge of what was to come later in the book and try to understand it as if it was the very first time that we were reading it. For the disciples, it was for them. They didn't understand. They had a great deal to learn. And so Jesus says they had to allow these things to sink into their ears. And here's maybe some encouragement to, uh, for us today. We should not expect people to simply understand everything first time around. Yeah, we need also to be patient and allow things to sink into the ears of those whom we are trying to teach. We might understand it. We might think that we understand all of this pretty well. We might think that we get the idea of suffering and death and, and, and resurrection, but for those who are hearing it for the first time, it just didn't make sense. And maybe there are many bits of it that still don't make sense for us today. Well, we need to let these things continue to sink into our ears too. Well, of all things, an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child, put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. I mean, could you imagine, could you imagine disciples of Jesus ever arguing? And, and could you imagine them ever arguing about something as preposterous as this, as to you know, who might be the greatest? I don't know what brought on such an argument. I wonder whether it was the fact that three of them had ascended the mountain with Jesus. Did they think that they were somehow a little superior? No, I don't know. You know, I mean, particularly in light of the failure of the others who had stayed behind in being unable to, uh, uh, to heal this poor lad. You know, you can almost imagine Peter or John or James saying, huh, well, you know, if we'd have been here, we'd have been able to do it, you know, sure. So that kind of thing, you, 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 people are people. I mean, that's, you know, this is what happens. And, and people have stupid little arguments like this. But don't you love the way that Jesus settled the matter? Yeah, he takes a child, and just sits the child uh, beside him, and he just, he, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't address the matter head on. He often doesn't address things head on, and, and there's probably a lesson for us to learn from that. Of course there is, 
But he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Now, it's true that children, you know, were not generally uh, worshipped in the way that some children might be worshipped today. I say that a little tongue in cheek, you understand. But, um, but among the Jews, children were generally uh, considered uh, with a, a little more respect than, than elsewhere, perhaps. But Jesus shows this child absolute respect. For he receives him fully in his name and says, anyone who does that receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you, he's the one who is great. Well, in conclusion, John answered, um, so maybe this is immediately on the back of this. It suggests that it might be that John answered by saying, Master, we, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and uh, we tried to stop him because he doesn't follow with us. And, and I get the idea that he's maybe saying that with a degree of smugness, maybe expecting to receive approval from Jesus, you know, maybe thinking that Jesus might say, oh, well done, you know, you got to stick up for not a bit of it. But he said to him, don't stop him. The one who is not against you is for you. We got to understand things like that within their context, don't we? But here was John, here was John demonstrating some sense of superiority because, you know, he was one of the in crowd, yeah? And um, the one who was doing this, uh, who was casting out demons in the name of Jesus, well, he wasn't. He wasn't among them, yeah? He wasn't one of them. He wasn't one of the chosen few, if you like. You know, he wasn't one of the, the special crew. Yeah? He, was, uh, he was someone else. And uh, so uh, we tried to stop him from doing it. And Jesus says, don't do that. And here's an important lesson. The one who isn't against you is for you. And Jesus there is speaking against any thoughts of exclusivity, yeah? any thoughts of sectarianism. He says, that's not the way of, um, of the Christ, that, um, that we, uh, we should not behave in that way. Uh, and so, um, that brings us to the end of this section. The beginning of the next section, I know it's not a chapter division, but it would have been if I was dividing them up, because from that point on, Jesus is now setting his face towards Jerusalem. And so that seemed like a good place to sort of finish this first 12 weeks, and then we'll continue with the next uh, round um, uh, the bulk of which we're, we're going to be heading towards Jerusalem, and then, then we're going to get there, and then we'll see what unfolds um, there, won't we? Let me very briefly mention what will happen, Lord willing, from next week. This is the, uh, the next round of classes. Yeah, we changed the poster for this. This is part two, uh, continuing on Monday evenings, on Thursday evenings at eight o'clock. John's going to be teaching some classes on Colossians. Then the last couple of weeks, um, Jack is going to be uh, looking at uh, uh, Paul's letter to uh, Philemon, at least I think it's the last couple of weeks, the last week at least, maybe it's the last couple. Um, and then we're going to have, uh, we'll have a, one of our quizzes um, beginning of July, then I think we're going to be taking a break uh, for the summer and resuming um, uh, after that okay so that's uh that's where we are then uh, looking ahead to next week and thank you all for being with us this week Let